Oh God, we finally got into the episode Shore Leave. <laughs> All right, Jimmy boy. Shore Leave, Shore Leave, Shore Leave. Oh, my paws and whiskers. I'll be late. This is easily the most surreal episode of Star Trek the original series and perhaps the entire franchise. Besides maybe Move Along Home, but that's surreal for a very different reason. Alamorain, count to four. Alamorain, count to four. Alamorain, then three more. Alamorain, if you can see. But this is Sacred Treks, a show where we take a look at every episode of Star Trek to see what we can glean from it, to learn lessons for our daily lives. So let's not be late for a very important date as we look at Shore Leave through the theme of meditation. This is Sacred Treks. Space, the final frontier. 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 It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. A <laughs> human being A single act of compassion can put you in touch with your own humanity. Loss of life is to be mourned, but only if the life was wasted. My child's was not. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us. You know, your father was captain of the starship for 12 minutes. He saved 800 lives. And I dare you to do better. You are Starfleet's captain. You believe in service, sacrifice, compassion, and love. The past is written. But the future is left for us to write. And we have powerful tools, Rios. Openness, optimism, and the spirit of curiosity. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds. To boldly go. Where no man has gone before. Let's start off, as always, with the synopsis of Shore Leave, where I make fun of the episode in order to remind us that while we are taking Star Trek as sacred and is something we love, it is not a perfect work, as nothing is. Though, to be fair, this episode almost intentionally makes fun of itself, so to be honest, this is going to be like shooting McCoys in a barrel. A beleaguered Enterprise crew arrives in orbit of Omicron Percy I-8. I am Lur of the planet Omicron Percy I-8. Sorry, uh, wrong show. Omicron Delta, I mean. This is an outrage! Captain Kirk asks for a little back massage. Kink in my back. That's it. A little, little higher, please. Push, push hard. What, what, what is happening here? And also, why is the girl doing this? Why, Spock's right there. Spock's right there. He could scratch your back, Kirk. You know he wants to. You know he wants to. On the planet, Sulu starts studying planet biology like a nerd after McCoy mentions Alice in Wonderland. And wouldn't you know it, a f appears in the woods. Almost like McCoy willed it into existence. Or was taking drugs. Probably the second option, McCoy seems like a man who would probably keep a bong in sickbay. In fact, I think we can see it in a few episodes. Kirk orders Shore Leave, but he and Spock both decide not to go down, probably because they want to spend a little time alone with each other. But Spock tricks Kirk into ordering himself to go on Shore Leave, so he beams down with his back massager to find McCoy, who's upset about his experience with You'd think the 23rd century wouldn't be so uptight about such things. Suddenly, Sulu starts shooting a gun that he found, without even bothering to question how he got it. Kirk thankfully goes to investigate with McCoy, and they are both tracked by the world's most inconspicuous antenna. Kirk reminisces about his time at the Academy being picked on by a man named Finnegan, who suddenly appears as a practical joker with the most stereotypical Irish accent since Scotty in front of him. Go ahead, lay one on me, because that's what you always wanted, isn't it? <laughs> and the two begin to fight. After hearing his back massager scream, Kirk runs to his young human's aid. Despite her shirt being torn, blood on the tree, and having literally just been fighting his childhood bully that couldn't possibly have been there, Kirk thinks his human must have just been imagining it. Are you sure you're not imagining all this? Captain, I know it sounds incredible, but I did not imagine it any more than I imagined he did this. Yeah, McCoy's rabbit we take seriously, but a woman clearly in distress I mean, she, she must be imagining things. Star Trek's gender politics really don't hold up, folks. Just, just saying. A girl should be 
Dressed like a fairy tale princess with lots of floaty stuff and a tall hat with a veil. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sulu is fighting a samurai. <laughs> I wonder why Sulu, of all people, is fighting the samurai. Probably for no particular reason. <laughs> Kirk goes running after Sulu, but gets distracted picking flowers, and surprise, a sexy young woman from Kirk's past appears, and Kirk gets all fuzzy-wuzzy and starry-eyed. Kirk is interrupted by his true love, though, Spock, who says sensors have found industrial activity under the planet. Meanwhile, McCoy starts to hit on Yeoman What's-Her-Name when suddenly a dress appears and the Yeoman basically states exactly how women were viewed at this time on television. Look at me, Doctor. A lady to be protected and fought for. <laughs> 1960s sexism is adorable. Anyways, on a completely different note, McCoy suddenly gets very, very creepy. Why don't you put it on? Don't peek. I, uh... It's okay, because the knight appears out of nowhere and stabs McCoy right after. <laughs> That's what you get for peeking, McCoy. Kirk shoots the knight, and Spock, having beamed down, examines the body of the knight and discovers that it's a manufactured body, which suddenly disappears when a World War II plane attacks and kills another crewman who incidentally, by the way, never shows back up at the end of the episode, so that's actually a weird dangly plot thread, is that crewman actually dead. Spock finally deduces what was obvious about 20 minutes ago, that crew members' thoughts are causing these sudden manifestations. Kirk recalls Finnegan, who he chases into Vasquez Rocks and fights him, again, for no real reason other than Kirk needed to tear his shirt this episode. Suddenly, an elderly man appears, calling himself the Caretaker. Probably the Caretaker from Voyager. I mean, canon connections, people, let's make it happen! The Caretaker informs them that the planet is an amusement park for people to live their fantasies. Odd, if it's an amusement park, you'd think they would have at least put up a sign or, like, charge entry like Disneyland. I mean, I paid a frick ton of money to get into Disneyland last time. Suddenly, the thought-dead McCoy appears with two sexy ladies on his arm, which totally must have been a slap in the face of the actual woman human that McCoy had been hitting on. It's okay, you're totally replaceable. Whatever, she ends up with McCoy anyways, because I guess she doesn't care that she's literally interchangeable with whatever manufactured sex dolls that McCoy has there. As Spock shows utter disregard for the woman on his arm, again fueling a million million fanzines that Spock is actually gay as he stares longingly at his real love Kirk, Kirk accepts the caretaker's offer to have his crew have shore leave and then heads off with Ruth, a girl so important to him that we never hear from her again, as Spock gets all upset that he still hasn't won Kirk's heart. So, sure leave. What are we to make of this episode beyond its fantasy, humor, and aged like a terrible, terribly moldy cheese treatment of women? Well, there's an interesting line at the end of the episodes. More complex the mind, the greater the need for the simplicity of play. Exactly, Captain. How very perceptive of you. That's the line that made me want to look at this episode through the theme of meditation. At the top of the episode, the crew has been working themselves non-stop for almost three months. Much of the crew is exhausted and tired, so much so that Kirk himself needs a dang back massage right now on the bridge. But Kirk has honestly been working himself to the bone and doesn't wish to have a rest. You see, Starfleet officers are the best of the best, always known for constantly working and being on their feet. They need to constantly be on the move to try to work to better themselves to feel that they are always doing their best. This is something that I know I feel quite often. Many of us live in a society where we are told our worth, our right to live, is about how much we output, about how much we work. That to relax is wasted time, it's wasted energy. To not do that is wasted time, and we can't have that because if I waste time, I'm not being worthwhile. And so I constantly have my headphones in, or I'm working on a next video, and my mind is always chugging along, always thinking. And if not, I'm anxious, stressed, and feeling bad about being a waste. Yet Spock mentions something at the top of the episode. On my planet, to rest is to rest, to cease using energy. To me, it is quite illogical to run up and down on green grass using energy instead of saving it. While Spock means this quite literally, as Vulcans do actually rest by doing nothing, he basically means meditation. To slow down, to stop, to empty your mind. You see, that is what meditation is, to practice mindfulness. To sit down and actually try to empty your mind. When you practice mindful meditation, the goal is to sit with your body, to focus on your breath, or the weight of your hands in your lap, or a sound. Just focus on being present in your body and mind, and let your senses and mind empty. To say, I'm going to pay attention to this one simple feeling for one, five, ten seconds. That is what Kirk tells his crew to do at the end of the episode. 
to try to empty your mind. Don't talk. Don't breathe. Don't think. But you see, this is a failing attempt that was never going to work. Our minds are always going too rapidly. Kirk and the crew always have another thought, another vivid imagination to conjure up on this shore leave planet. And in meditation, you're not going to be able to fully empty your mind. You're always going to jump to something new to have your mind race again. What am I making for dinner? Did I get that project done? Why did Kirk and Spock never actually make out on screen like they should have? All of these thoughts will enter your mind, just as they do for Kirk and the crew on the planet. But that isn't a failure on your part or in meditation. It's actually the whole point. The point is to get distracted, to see the wildness of your mind again and again and again and again, and then get distracted again and again, and just keep restarting the cycle of emptying your mind, getting distracted, realizing it, then emptying your mind again. The goal of this is to become familiar with your mind, to understand how it works, to take you a moment out of your endless cycle of self-obsession, this endless cycle that we thought we trapped ourselves in, just to step away from it and recognize it for a moment, to just consciously see it. That's what I like about this episode, because it shows the crew doing just that. It literalizes their wildest thoughts of fancy and makes them actual and real. An offhand thought about a childhood friend or a samurai or Don Juan for some reason gets literalized and actualized in a way that feels surprising and sometimes even threatening to the crew, because they are forced to confront the endless ebbs and flows of their mind, to step back and look at what their thoughts actually are, and to try to reorient themselves to a place of calm and emptiness in order to find that play again. So. In the midst of all this anxiety that I know pretty much every single one of us has had to live with in some way or another in 2020, I ask you to find a way to take your short leave and just take a moment to reflect on your thoughts, maybe through meditation or something else that works for you, like taking a shower sometimes does for me, and just sit with yourself for a few moments and empty your mind. But before you do that, don't forget to leave a comment down on this video or subscribe to this channel for more videos on Star Trek, pop culture, geek culture, all that fun stuff that I do right here on Jesse Jandra's channel. I don't know why I suddenly became Foghorn Leghorn. That's just the thing that happens on this channel as well. I hope you enjoy. But regardless of if you subscribe, check out the podcast, comments, all that stuff, I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Huh, huh, here we go. So I'm finally here performing for you. If you know the words, you can join in too. Put your hands together if you want to clap as I thank you all with this patron rap. Huh, Catherine Lambeth, Miranda Janelle, Ashley Allen, Bo Kikio, Eli Bergmas, Aslan Solstice, John Cool, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Felicia Toast, Wellington Marcus, Boyd Earl and Mary Beth Earl, Stephen Schuhart, Wayne Twitchell, Corey Honkinen, and Vale Dunn, A Man Chooses a Slave Obeys, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, Buttoneer, John Steele, what does God need with a starship? Michael Beam, Meadow Whisperer, William Steele, Chamomile Tea, BBD, Moonir Amlani, Jason Knott, John Weatherby, Maeve Liama, Bree Beecher, Andrew K, Nathan Steele, Sky Skinner, Sean Piper, Flynn, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Tiffany Danger, Cast the Lass, Laura Dermero, Geek Filter, Mari Neckar, Troy Stull, Gretchen Badger, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Bush, Jane Packard, James Krivda, Din, W. Randy, E. D. Ellie O'Dare, John H. McDougal, Celestial John, Jacob Tovar, Sarah Bystam, Jessica Chapman, Lisa, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Polly Mina, Andrew Lamoureux, Jennifer Fuss, Zone One Librarian, Jenny Mabel, and Michael Hardy. Thank you so much. I hope you appreciate me being a dorky weirdo that's totally off key with any sort of beat, but thank you so much, patrons. I love you all.